Hello and welcome to this final workshop of Custodian. Let's wait a couple of, or three minutes uh, until more attendees uh, join the meeting and uh, we will start. Thank you. Hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes perfect. You can hear you. Sorry, because uh, I had some problems with the computer. I had to change and uh, run out of time. Sorry. Okay. So let's start while uh, new attendees are uh, joining us in the next few minutes. Let's uh, start making an introdu introduction about this final workshop of Custodian. First of all, just to explain uh, what's Custodian. Custodian is a laser research project to achieve better efficiency and, and cost, as we will explain. And it's uh, a project that has received funding from the Horizon 2020 program. Uh, the consortium uh, that has been working for the last uh, more than three years in this in this project is uh, formed by IMEN, K Labs, uh, Politecnico di Milano, SECFO, IDME, GFM, Presitec, Marelli, NIT, and Tuvien. And uh, uh, in this workshop today, what we want to uh, show you is the, are the results that uh, we have obtained and to explain you the new methodology that can be used in different applications in different industries uh, through different use cases in order to show uh, well or the possibilities that this uh, new technology uh, has and the good results that we have achieved. And the workshop will take uh, one hour between one hour and a half and, and two hours. Uh, and uh, in in the agenda, as you can see, we will have uh, an explanation about the the, the custodian project, uh, the MPLC technology uh, explained. Uh, also, uh, well, uh, the the custodian project explained uh, by Aymen, the MPLC technology by K Labs. Then we will have a use case of laser beam welding uh, explained by Aymen and Marelli. Uh, after that, we will have the PVF uh, LVM uh, that is powder bed fusion in on laser beam in metal uh, use case by IDME and GFM. And finally, a use case about laser cutting uh, explained by Presitec. The people who will be today with us in this workshop are Daniel Gesto from IMEN, uh, Gwen Palier from K Labs, Jorge Arias uh, and from IMEN, and Mario Brignone from Marelli, explaining the laser beam welding use case, 
Mario Martinez from IDIME and Francesco Stortiero from uh, GFM uh, talking about the PBF use case. And finally, uh, Marcus Kogel from Presitec talking about the laser cutting uh, use case. You can know more about the, the custodian project visiting the shapeyourlaser.eu website. And during the, the workshop, you can introduce your questions and, and doubts. You can leave them directly here on the right in the, in the chat. You have the icon below on the right. And, and during the Q&A slot at the end of the workshop, the speakers will answer uh, all the questions. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Sergio Saez from SECFO and I will be uh, moderating this uh, workshop. Uh, thank you. And let's start with the workshop with Daniel Gesto from IMEN presenting you Custodian. Okay, thanks Sergio for the introduction. Let me share my desktop. Well, first of all, thanks to you all for joining us in this final workshop of Custodian. Uh, before moving on, on my PPT, could you see my PPT now? Yes, perfect. It's good. Okay. Well, before moving on my PPT, just uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Daniel Festo. I'm the project manager of Custodian and, and work at IMEN Technology Center in Spain. Well, today uh, we are going to present you uh, the results we have got uh, during the last almost four years in three application use cases in laser beam welding, PVF, and cutting, uh, in which we have applied the uh, custodian methodology that we have developed in, during the project. So, well, this, this, this methodology, uh, the main aim of this methodology, which is the main goal of the project, is, is just to, to provide answers and solutions to those uh, currently industrial challenges in the laser world that cannot be solved by using uh, conventional laser systems. So the outline of my presentation, uh, first of all, I, I will make a short introduction about beam shaping, which is a trending topic today in, in the laser world. Then I will move on and providing you just uh, general information and, and so, uh, just a few words about the, our methodology uh, using Custodian. And then I will just introduce the three application use cases that later on will be explained it in detail by, by my colleagues. So, well, what you can see here, uh, and, and it's a brief introduction, very brief introduction to beam shaping world, is uh, that today uh, there are currently some solutions in the market uh, providing beam shaping solutions uh, to solve different uh, applications in, in, in the market. Uh, and there are also others that are being uh, relatively new and are, most of them are under development. And here you can find, for example, the, the solution from Seven based on optical phase array, the, the, the one uh, that are used, using diffractive optical elements, the, the one from Paul adjustable remote, special light modulator, the form of our mirrors or refractive optical elements. Each one of these uh, has its own features regarding different uh, characteristics like, for example, um, well, uh, shaping complexity, power handling, even cost uh, efficiency, or the possibility of coupling every technology with existing laser systems. Some of them needs, uh, need uh, a specific new one. Uh, some others can be implemented with uh, current systems. And let me introduce very briefly uh, the one we have uh, used in, in, in Custodian. It's called Multiplane Light Conversion, MPLC, which is a technology patent and developed by our French partner, uh, K-Labs. And uh, well, what I can say here is uh, this technology is able to obtain freeform beam shaping through succession of the spatial phase profiles and propagation. Uh, I will not go in details in, on that since uh, our colleagues from K-Labs will provide you later on more details about it. But uh, what we can see after the results we have obtained, this is this technology that comes from the communications world. Uh, is an excellent candidate for high power 
uh, laser sources in order to obtain beam shaping. Well, as I commented before, uh, just very brief uh, information about uh, about Custodian. This is a project that has been funded in the call H2020 ICT, particularly on the topic ICT4. Uh, the project has almost 5 million euros of, of budget and the, the consortium is composed by 10 partners from five different European countries. Uh, the duration of the, the, or the project has taken uh, 45 months, is finishing today officially, even though we still have two months to complete all the information to be provided to the European Union. And, uh, well, just uh, as Sergio said, just to provide you the, our website in which you can uh, see all the information uh, we have uh, generated during the project. Well, just a few words about the methodology. Uh, well, this methodology is, is uh, composed by different stages. The first one is the consists on the definition of the optimal thermal cycle for every uh, challenging application by analyzing both the process and the material. So once uh, this uh, desired temperature profile or thermal cycle is defined, then we move on the second stage, which is which deals with uh, laser process simulation. So the idea here is to define an optimal beam shape in order to reach or obtain this, uh, this thermal cycle that we have defined before. Obviously, we have a third stage consisting on the manufacturing of this beam shape by using the MPLC technology. And finally, uh, we have the integration of this MPLC technology in different uh, applications. For example, in IMEN, it was implemented in an LBW in a cell, uh, and in the case in ID, of IDME, it was implemented in a PVF system. And also, Presitec has integrated this uh, MPLC solution for uh, cutting purposes in their facilities. And we also have another stage consisting on developing an inline control system based on medium wave infrared uh, sensor that was uh, developed by NEET and, and IMEN. So, well, what you will see in the following PPTs uh, for, for every use case is how we have applied this methodology in every application. So, just to very briefly introduce the, the three uh, use cases, uh, LBW, the first one in which we have been working in order uh, to increase the productivity and robustness in stainless steel welding for exhaust system components with our end user Marelli. In the case of PVF, what we try is to solve the challenging, the challenge of uh, building or, or additive manufacturing of, of, of components based on nickel alloys, uh, which is a quite challenging material due to the, it's difficult to avoid cracks when you are working with these uh, materials. And finally, we also have, as I mentioned before, the cutting application in which we have increased or tried to increase the quality and productivity of the cutting process by in steel, in steel uh, mainly st stainless steel. And this will be presented later on by, by Presitec. So just, uh, well, uh, I don't want to go in details, but just to let you know that uh, our colleagues will present uh, the case of LBW very good results. In fact, by today, we received very good news from Marelli. Uh, they were uh, testing uh, the final components we weld at Ayman. So the results are very, very good. So uh, Mauro, my colleague Mauro, and also Jorge will provide you more details about it later on. Regarding the PDF use case, uh, our colleagues from IDM and GFM will show you more details about it, but uh, just to so you on the right hand side a uh, uh, clear image in which uh, we can see that most of cracks in in in, in a component uh, that was manufactured in the pvf system in inconel 713 were uh, dramatically reduced regarding the 
the the conventional uh, systems. And finally, well, just to uh, introduce the, the cutting the cutting application, which Presidic will provide as well more details later on. And here on the right hand side, you can see uh, the surface uh, of the cutting edge in different thicknesses. So, well, I don't want to to steal more time. I think uh, as an interaction is more than enough. So, well. As I mentioned, uh, you will uh, learn more about in the following talks. So, hope uh, you enjoy this this webinar. So, thanks again for for joining us today, and hope this uh, this webinar uh, covers your expectations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Now. Uh, First of all, before uh, presenting the different use cases, I will share um, a video with uh, a presentation of uh, our colleague uh, Gwen Palier from. Sorry, this is not. This is not okay. It's here from K Labs presenting the MPLC technology. Uh, in the first part, I will share the, this video, and then we will pass to the to the use cases. Hi everyone, I'm really glad to be here uh, with you for this uh, nice presentation about the Castigen results, the European project that the Kylabs we have been really happy to participate in. And in this presentation, uh, I will be actually describing uh, a, a dynamic MPLC for laser beam welding. So unfortunately, I cannot be in live uh, with you uh, today, so I will be recording a video, but I will be really happy to answer any email you will have uh, any question uh, you, you can send me or send to uh, my colleague from, uh, from uh, the Custodian Consortium. My name is uh, Gwen. I'm uh, working at Kylabs, uh, who are actually in uh, charge of uh, the um, dynamic uh, MPLC for the beam shaping. So let me start uh, with a few words about uh, Kylabs. KLabs, we are actually a deep tech company who is uh, based uh, in France, in the west of France, and we are actually developing, manufacturing, and selling uh, innovative optical components uh, who are actually doing uh, beam shipping for a lot of different applications. This technology is actually uh, really new. It's a very new way to sync uh, the, the light shaping, and it has actually been developed by our CEO during uh, his PhD uh, uh, more than 10 years ago. The technology is uh, patented and we work with partners all over the world and we are now more than 50 in the company and we are actually just moving to a, a, a very new and nice uh, big building in uh, Rennes. So let's now uh, go to uh, the most important part, uh, how the MPLC is uh, actually uh, working. So MPLC stands for multi-plane light conversion. As I say, it's a really new way to sync light propagation. When you do beam shaping, you can be using a lot of different laws of optics. You could be using, for example, the law of diffractions. That's what uh, DOE, diffractive optical elements, are using. So it's based on somehow uh, uh, some very specific uh, law of optics. You can do also stand-up shaping using the laws of uh, just Fresnel propagation. That's what you are doing, for example, when you are um, uh, using uh, uh, the objective of your uh, uh, um, of any system, a microscope, or, or to take uh, pictures. Uh, in KLabs, we use uh, the multiple light conversion, which is actually based on mode propagation. So we will be using uh, the laws of the propagation of each single mode of the lasers, and that's how we will actually ship it one mode after the other. Doing that, uh, we can do actually any kind of shaping. It's really free form. We, we can do very complex shape. They can be symmetric or symmetric. They can have a lot of different size. Uh, and this is very important. In addition to having the capability to um, uh, shape the intensity profile, we also have the capability to shape the phase profile. So generally what we will do is that we will try to have a plano phase where we have our intensity beam, which is, um, made and this will enable us to have a very nice uh, depth of field we will have our uh, depth of field which is more or less preserved compared to the input beam so we do that through a succession of face plates so that's what you can see on the image on the left you have a lot of different face plates one after the other and the light is growing through all of them 
and you have to have a sufficient propagation in between the different phase plates. This is fully passive, as you can see, there is no moving parts. It's just really uh, different phase plate one after the other. This actually, uh, along the way, uh, we realized that uh, it was more convenient to implement it in a reflective way. So now we are having actually two mirrors. One of them is textured, the other one is just a normal mirror, and you have the light which is going back and forward both mirrors. This way, it's much more easy to align. It's also much more compact, and having it reflective is very good for a lot of things. For example, it's very good to handle high power and high energy. It's also very good uh, for the spectrum preservation, for example. At last, uh, as you can see in this image, you can have multiple BIM at the input or multiple BIM at the output. It means that we can combine BIMs in order to make another BIMs, or we can have one BIM that we will be splitting in different shapes, for example. Uh, the example that you can see uh, on the right and in the middle is for telecommunication. Uh, this is definitely not uh, what we'll be discussing today, but it was the first MPLC that we have developed. And actually the technology can be applied to a lot of different applications. For example, telecommunication, it can be uh, just um, a standard fiber telecommunication uh, on the ground, but it can also be space communication, meaning the improvement of the communication in between satellites or, or, or things like that it can also be applied to defense and to medical. But today we will actually focus on laser material processing application uh, it, we have developed system working with um, Pulse Laser as well as with High Power CW Laser. We will be focusing on microprocessing with High Power CW Laser and especially on laser beam welding. Let me now uh, show you just a short uh, video uh, about uh, the MPLC so that you can see uh, how it's working in video. So here you can see the different face plates and the light going through them. You can have actually a lot of different face plates. You can be adding more and more of them depending on what you need to do. Combining the beams, making complex shape, dividing the beams, having some specific properties for your own face. So here you can see a cavity with the two mirrors, the textured one and just a standard mirror. In that case, the MPLC will help combine the different bins. It's for the uh, communication application. And as you can see, each of the input fiber will deliver a different shape that will be injected into one multimode fiber. Let's get back to laser beam welding. So as you can see here, these cavities uh, are actually made into a box with an input and an output, all this being uh, free space. In the case of laser beam welding, it's not possible to have a system uh, as such for two reasons mainly. First one is that uh, we... Okay, thank you uh, to... Thanks to, to Gwen for, for this video explaining the MPLC. I cut it because for laser beam welding, now what we have is uh, Jorge Arias from uh, IMEN and Mauro Brignone from Marelli, who will uh, explain uh, in depth uh, the laser beam welding use case. Uh, I don't know if Jorge can share. Okay. Perfect. Jorge and, and Mario uh, and Mauro, sorry, you can uh, switch on your your camera in order for people to to see you. And when you are available, okay. Jorge, you can start. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I was trying to 
to switch on everything <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> That's not possible. Okay, um, yes. uh, I will. Oh, Mauro Millone from Marelli and myself, Jorge Arias from Naime. We will present the application of the reshaping by MPLC, the MPLC technology and the inline control system for to the measurement welding of automotive exhaust parts. Uh, sorry. I will follow the, the methodology for for the beam customization explained by by my colleague Daniel in the interaction. We will start presenting the problem, then how we study the material and the process to to determine what uh, how we change the thermal cycle of the process to eliminate the defects present in the welding, and then use this information as an input for the laser process simulation and, and the combined beam, beam modeling to provide uh the bean shape that can match the the thermal cycle that we uh, we well that, that we decide to achieve when we get this bean shape is in yeah we have used multiplane light conversion technology to implement this bean shape and in parallel um, we have developed a line control system based on on infrared, on infrared high speed infrared sensor to control the to, to control the process to, for, for process monitoring and control. And we have integrated both systems and we have tested to solve the original problem. So starting with the problem, please Mauro, I let you the floor. Mauro, can you connect? Yes. Your micro is open, but I cannot hear you. Yeah, but it seems he is okay. having problems because uh, I, know, it's the, I cannot see the, mic the micro in his connection. I don't know what happened. No, but but uh, it's it's open eh? as as a host. I can see that it's it's open. It's okay. okay. Yeah, Mauro, are you there? It's strange. If not, maybe Jorge, you can continue with a short introduction about this component. In the... Yeah, it's, I think we know the the, the current problems they are having in the production. Yeah. Now, yes. ah, we can hear you, Mauro. Okay, Mauro. Okay, sorry uh, for the problem. Uh, my name is Mauro Brignone. I work in the innovation department of uh, Marelli um, Green Technology System. Uh, we developed exhaust system for, for the automotive, and we are involved in this project, of course, as a user proposing our application for uh, the technology developed in the framework of the, of the project. Um, as you probably know, the um, geometrical matching is a, a crucial issue um, in the laser beam welding, the geometrical matching between the two parts to be, to be welded. And this is particularly true, two parts are particularly thin. And in the exhaust, automotive exhaust system application, uh, we usually uh, weld together very thin uh, sheets, uh, ranging from 1.5 millimeter down to 0 0.7 millimeter, so very thin. So you, it's easy to understand that in such, um, in such conditions, it's crucial and very important to manage large, relatively large gaps between the two parts to be uh, welded and to manage the fact that these uh, gaps can be uh, variables. So it can be in the same sample, zero gaps up to 0 0.4 millimeters of, of, of gap. Uh, 
in order to avoid a problem with the standard laser beam technologies, uh, tools are used in order to press together the two parts to be welded, so to um, to um, decrease or nullify all the gaps between the two parts. But these uh, tools are usually very expensive and uh, decrease, uh, slow down uh, the, 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 the process uh, speed. So um, decreasing the advantages uh, of the laser wheel being standard um, welding process. Um, the custodian technology is uh, uh, very promising in solving this kind of source a proper and beam shaping is possible to um, manage um, large gaps, relatively large gaps between the two parts of the work, and also the gaps without the use of any of the tools. So the uh, process cost decreases because there are no tools, and also the process speed. With, with. Mauro, it seems that we are having problems with your sound. I don't know if you could uh, talk uh, more close to the to the to your laptop or PC in order to to increase the the volume or your voice. Okay. Can I repeat something? Well, it's strange because sometimes I don't know if you have a micro. Sometimes it appears and it disappears. Can you try again? Okay. Can I repeat the comments at the beginning? No, no. If you can continue, but it it's strange because sometimes it's very very clear and sometimes not, and I don't know the reason because you were talking all the time in the same direction. Then actually, yes, I haven't touched the the microphone. No. Okay, okay, continue, please. Sorry. Okay, I actually I was uh, I was at the end, uh, as you can see in uh, in the pictures in in the slides. Uh, in, in the picture in the middle, it's possible to see, well, the details are very small, so it's not easy to, 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 to see it clearly, but it's possible to see um, a variable gap between the two half shells of a, a rear model. Um, and these uh, variable gaps uh, can lead to um, possible laser defects, as uh, is uh, represented in the picture on, on, on the right. Uh, as you can see, these pictures taken from uh, underneath uh, shows that uh, the, um, the welding is not uh, full everywhere. There are some spots where the, um, the, the, the welding is, is full, so for all the, the thickness, others in which the, the welding is not, uh, is not complete. With the technology developed in Custodian, this uh, uh, problem is uh, solved without the use of any tool, so uh, without increasing the cost of, of, of the process and without decreasing the speed of, of the process. That's all from my side. I'm again. I'm sorry for for the audio problems. I do not understand why they happened. Okay. Thank you, Mauro. No, it, it was clear now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. As you can, as Mauro explained, when you try to optimize the welding parameters, in this case, we have studied the, the welding of three three hundred four L stainless steel. And we have used um, for this um, yeah, for this optimization um, a configuration, an overlap joint configuration of two one millimeter thick uh, flat sheets. And we when we change different parameters like laser power, welding speed, being a spot diameter, and we ungap separation between the sheets. And you see there the the optimal parameters that we found for kilowatts, 100 millimeters per second, zero gap, and the focusing of plus five millimeter. And on the 
bottom left hand, you can see that the, all the, the, the cross-section of these welding bits obtained with these parameters and all the, all the quality requirements made by, made by, by Marelli were met. But the problem arises when when there is a gap between the two sets, the problem that explained Mauro in the pre, in, in the previous uh, slide, when we increase this the, the gap from point one to point three, you can see that the 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 the, the, weld, the welding mold, melt pool starts to drop between the two sheets and there is a incompletely filled groove. There is a difference between the top surface and the surface of the welding bit that that should be lower than 0.2 millimeter, but in this case is higher than 0.3. And when we go further on to 0.4 millimeter, the, this this problem is even worse. And also we have we we have got got uh, lack of penetration. So we have to we well, we we have an, uh, analyze, analyzed the process and also the material to and propose some experiments to check or to see how to change the thermal cycle and how it could could affect to them to this to this to these defects. So we what we carried out were some experiments with preheating with preheating of the of the joint um, from room temperature to several hundred degrees C and for temperatures higher than 300 degrees C you can see on, on the bottom that even for 0.3 millimeter gap the um, the quality requirements are met so this give this gave us a hint to how to to implement the bin shape through the simulation in combination with beam modeling. So the Technical University of, of, Bin, of Vienna uh, have developed a laser beam welding model, in this case for this material, for stainless steel 3400L, and well, for the same plates dimension, thicknesses, the same gaps, laser, the same laser uh, Parameters, they are able, they were able to develop this model. You can see you know, here some 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 images of the simulated welding bit, and you can see here the comparison of the of this simulation with the real welding bit. On the top, you can see a longitudinal section of the welding bit. For 3.5 kilowatts and 100 millimeters second and gap 0.3, and you can see that only the full penetration is achieved in some parts, some parts of the of the of the total length of the of the welding bit, and you can see that there is also this difference between the top surface of the of the upper sheet and the surface of the welding bit, and you can see that the, the simulation reproduces this this effect also on the top on the bottom you can see the cross section of these same uh, for or the similar welding bits on the left for the real welding bit on the on on the right the simulation and you can see that the geometrical features of the welding bit is very is very similar in the simulation regarding to the to the real the real case here on on the top you have you have a high speed video of the of the of the molten path and you can see on the on the bottom the simulation using this model and you well uh, you can observe that well, the simulation matches almost perfectly the the process behavior the dynamics of them of the of the mountain bull, the keyhole, and also the the fumes coming from the from the welding. Sorry. Okay, so we proposed 
um, a beam shape for laser beam welding when the, um, we the, we still have the the high the well, the small high power primary beam responsible of the welding here in, in red and a sec, as a rectangular secondary beam that goes um, before this this the primary beam that is responsible of the preheating of the of the joint so in the simulation using this model developed by by two beam um, we have well uh, they have changed some parameters like the offset or the, the width of the rectangular beam the length and also the power of this secondary beam and the well, for example you can see here on the top um, the real case where there is no secondary being at all and you see that there is like a penetration also there is a uh, completely filled groove well the yeah the surface of the welding bit is lower well um, much lower than the upper surface of the the, the surface of the upper sheet and on, on the bottom you can see the simulation but in this case with an with an optimized secondary beam for the same parameters, 3.5 kilowatts, 100 millimeters per second, and 0.4 millimeter of, of gap. And you can see that with the simulation um, gives us as a result that you can achieve um, full penetration along almost al al along uh, almost the length, the, the complete length of the welding bit, and the geometrical dimensions. Um, features of this of, of this welding bit, the cross section and seeing the cross section com meets the quality requirements by Marelli. So, from this sim from these simulations, they have um, determined the dimensions for the length for the tangle for the tangular the, the secondary beam, 1.5 millimeter. The well, the width could be changed. Change from 0.7 to 1.3 millimeter, and the power ratio between the primary and the secondary beam could be between 8, 20, or 67, 33 percent. And that's and this and this is this means is what we have implemented with the multiplane light conversion technology, mainly by Calabs, to in, in or to, to to provide this this being safe. In this case, we we are asking for a fixed primary beam diameter or of 0.77 millimeter, a fixed secondary beam length of 1.5 millimeter, a variable secondary beam width, and also a fixed relative position between primary and secondary beams, and the, and, the, and also the possibility to adjust the power ratio between the primary and the secondary beams. Here is the yeah, the design of this dynamic MPLC carried out by Kylabs. You, you, uh, the, the dynamic MPLC system is that this the, that bigger box in the center. On the bottom, you can see the um, the main dynamic MPLC optic that provides this this beam shape. And on on, on one uh, at the input of this MPLC, we have the the fiber connector and the collimator, and at the output of the of the MPLCs, we have the the Presitec laser beam welding bender and the focusing optics. The Presitec the beam bender allows us to uh, adjust there or integrate there the the embedded control system in the optical port. Here you can see well, the configuration they used in Kylabs for the laboratory validation at low power. They used a, a, a LED, low, a low power LED to check the well, check the features of the of this the dynamic MPLC. You can see here there the the Galbo mirror because this the MPLC now is open in this. In this picture, you can see the cable mirror that is responsible for the variation 
of the secondary beam with changing changing the angle of these carbon mirrors, you can change the variable width. And this mirror is positioned in a linear stage moved by a piezoelectric that could allow us to change the power ratio between the primary and the secondary beam. And you can see here the, the, on the left hand, uh, on, on the top uh, image, you can see how it's possible to change the width of the other rectangular beam, beam, other rectangular beam, beam, and on the on, on the on the left also, um, below this image, you can see the the different images for the variation of the power ratio between the primary beam, completely at at one hundred percent on the left, to one hundred percent on the secondary beam. But these were these were measurements carried out at Skylabs. For, as I mentioned, for a low power LED laser. So, in parallel to this this process, in, we develop in collaboration with it, a new infrared technologies. We develop an an inline control system for laser beam welding. You can see here all the main features of this of this embedded system. We have an embedded system of the um, high speed infrared sensor with a FPGA architecture that allows us to um, to, more, to to process the images and extract the main features for these images, mainly the melt melt pool area, melt, melt pool dimensions, etc. And also embedded in this in, in this system is the uh, CPU. That um, allows the control, the closed loop, loop control of the process using one analog signal for the power laser and an Ethernet uh, signal for the, the for the width of the secondary pin connected connected it to the PLC. First, we define the monitoring features. From left to right, you can see the row on the left, the row image is given by the high speed infrared sensor in 2D and 3D. On the center, you can see the process image, mainly extracting the background. And on the right, you, you have the different features we analyzed to be used as a reference to, to control the, the process. Mainly for the melt pool length, the melt pool width, the melt pool area, the maximum value, and, but also the horizontal profile area and the vertical profile area. So we carried out a correlation between these monitoring features and the process parameters, uh, power, speed, and so on, to see um, or to find which feature could allow us to control the process where it is completely or more correlated with the with the process and the and each parameter mainly the pa the power and the and the width of the secondary beam and here has the the, the prototype the uh, manufactured in, in custodian for the, this FPGA embedded in line control system and also we have developed uh, well, we have created this uh, capture and visualization software that could be used as with a piece well, well, that could be used from a PC connected to, to the embedded embedded control system and that uh, acting as a human machine interface for the operator. So once we have the the, P, the MPLC system and the inline control the inline control system we integrated both and make it the, the, the testing. And you, well, we have integrated the MPLC in a laser beam welding cell at Iman. We well, the integration of the, the, of, the, of the dynamic MPLC with the Presitec laser beam weld modules were carried out on Kylabs. We integrated here in Iman the, well, all the complete system, the MPLC with the, with the Presitec modules. We integrated the complete system with a with a with a cooker robot, 
and we provided a cooling circuit for the MPLC to avoid any heating, well, any damage to the optics caused by the heating by the laser. Also, we integrated a flow, a water flow sensor with the safety interlock of the laser to well, to close to shut up to yeah, to close the, the laser or, or switch off the laser in case the temperature rises above. Oh, sorry, the, the the water flow goes down certain threshold. The, and well, after after this integration, we characterize the beam shape. First, the primary beam caustic using the 100% of the power to the primary beam. And we achieve when we, we check that we get a, a primary beam diameter of 20, 0 0.75 millimeter. And we also characterize the secondary beam dimensions and the power ratio. We saw that we, we, just, we have a variable width between 0 0.75 and 1.77 millimeter. And we were able to change the power ratio between zero and, and 100% between the, the primary and the secondary beam. You can see, well, here, this, these measurements now are, this, well, these images are now um, for high power laser. These were, so in comparison with the, what I, what the, with the ones I, pre, I'm, I presented before at low power, but we're carried out at Skylabs. And you can see, well, here's how we, we are able to change them. So what we, at this stage, what we have to perform was a calibration between the voltage applied to the galvo mirrors and the beam, and the secondary beam width, and also a calibration between the position of this galvo mirror, measuring steps. As you can see on the right hand, each step could be a few microns. And you can see how we change the power ratio of the between the primary and the secondary beam for this high power of the laser. So once we have this calibration made for the for the power ratio and also the beam width, the sorry, the secondary beam width, we carry out um, well, we check the the parameters we got from the from the simulation. And for example, in this case, we have used the power ratio of 67, 33 percent, a beam width of 0.7 millimeters, and a laser power of six kilowatts. Total laser power between the primary and secondary beam of six kilowatts, a speed of 80 millimeters per second, and we change the gap. First, you can see here the um, well, for gap zero and gap zero, zero point three, that we are able to to meet all the quality requirements by Marelli, and you can both well, and with uh, well, with uh, total total penetration al along the com the complete length of the is being welded bit, and also we will minimizing the the incomplete field group being lower than 0.2 millimeter. For example, comparing with the conventional welding head, you can see here. That for conventional welding head and point three and a gap of 0.3 millimeter, we 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 got an incomplete field groove of 0.3 millimeter. There is a difference between the upper the surface of the upper um, plate and the surface of the welding bit of 0.33 millimeter. So there is a considerable improvement regarding the the conventional welding. We also carried out some power control tests with MPLC. You can see on the on the left with no control we change first on the first half of the welding bit you can see in green we we, we use a power of five kilowatts and then on the half of the for the from the half of the of the welding bit length we we use six kilowatt and you can see this in green is one of the features we use for the control and by applying the control, you can see that the, we are able to man, to keep the more or less constant this this feature that we are use we are using, and we are able to to obtain a full penetration in the welding bit. So with this with these um, good results, we we go we produce several parts 
for, for be te to be tested at Marelli. These parts are mm, tubular parts, similar to the SOX system configuration produced by Marelli. They, they consisted of two tubes, one inside of, uh, partially inside of the other. The wall thickness was of one millimeter, and we and they produce the samples to for with different gaps between them from zero to zero point four. We use, as you can see on the right hand, on the center, the conventional uh, the conventional the experiment, the experimental setup for the conventional conventional being welding. A head and on the right, we do have the experimental configuration used for the for these same experiments, but with the MPLC. Again, with the conventional laser beam welding head, with gap zero, there is no problem. But when we go go to gap zero point three with these tubular parts, we obtain again a completely filled group higher than 0.2 millimeter. But by using the MPLC, as you can see here, the, we are able to, to meet the, the quality requirements by Marelli. And also in the next slide, you can see and we, you, the, the difference or we have them, we cut the, this welding bit in, in, with the two tubes. And, and in the opposite parts, we, we have the different gap in the on the left on the left you have a gap higher than 0.2 millimeter on the right you have a gap lower than 0.2 millimeter but in both in in both cases we are able to to meet the quality requirements regarding yeah to, uh, full penetration completely field growth etc and now this uh, well, we produce several several tubes welded tubes and now they are being tested and at Marelli and well, a few hours ago we well, Marelli sent us the, the preliminary the preliminary results in this case for high temperature fatigue testing with temperatures mm, mm, about 400 500 degrees C and with this, and you can see, and on the on the left, and you have the uh, table where you, we compare the standard uh, welding and the welding with the MPLC for um, different gaps between zero and zero point four. And these are the average values, the the total number of cycles that the, that the the these components were able to withstand. And these are the average values. To the to the all the different parts provided, and you can see that there is always a well, much better results for the MPLC system than for the standard SA being welding head. Not not only that, but also if we consider the worst case, where the worst result for the MPLC and the worst result for the standard SA being welding, we still get better result with the MPLC system. Yes, Jorge, uh, yes. just uh, okay. uh, a little comment. The worst case is uh, um, done by comparing the worst case of uh, custodian technology with yeah. the best case of standard technology. Yeah. So it's a worst case just in the, uh, from, from the point of view of uh, custodian technology. So we compare the worst of custodian with the best of standard and we are still very high, very, we, we, we see a, an, in, a, an important increase in the, in the performance up to 35% uh, more cycles of hot uh, fatigue. So it's a very, uh, I would not say promising because it's, it's not a promise, no, it's something it's already. A fact. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. And to conclude, yeah, we, we develop a new methodology of application, even maybe interior material for lacing beam welding. We achieve a being a being safe design for this case, specific case of laser beam welding, and we have developed also a plus loop line control system based on uncooled high speed infrared sensor 
and FPAG architecture to assure the quality and the immediacy, and the immediacy of the being safe requirements. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, if you have any question, please um, write it down uh, in the chat, and we I'm, and we will try to answer them at the end of the of the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jorge and and Mauro. Really uh, good results, as you said. Uh, new methodology, uh, the beam for the laser beam welding process and the inline control system, and all working and with the um, best results that we could uh, imagine before the project. And congratulations to to all of you for for these good results. And let's go with the other uh, use case with Mario Martinez from Idime and Francesco Sortiero from GFM who will talk about the use case for the PBF, the powder bed fusion in, uh, in beam, uh, well, in, in with the, sorry, the laser beam in metal. Okay. And when you're available, Mario. Can you see the screen? Yes. 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 If I skip to the next slides, you can see it, right? Yes. yes. Okay, the, you have um, a, a square on the right that you should... Ah, uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, now it's okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So, um, a good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending this uh, custodian workshop today. Uh, I will join my colleagues to thank you for, for staying here uh, today. I hope it's been uh, useful for you all. Uh, my name is uh, Mario Martinez Ceniceros, and I'm... Uh, uh, working as a research and development engineer in the Advanced Manufacturing Processes Unit at IDME. So, uh, today I'm presenting you the development and, uh, in summary, the roadmap that we have followed uh, these last few years in, in the powder bed fusion laser beam melting technology uh, to bring um, tailored uh, custom beams that uh, helps us to to tackle some uh, certain uh, issues that we have detected in, in, in while processing certain alloys. Right. Uh, as as uh, mentioned by Jorge, and uh, uh, it's pretty similar, but uh, uh, this can be a very clear scheme of, of the methodology that uh, we have followed within Custodian Project. So, although the problems presented by each of the technologies are uh, different, because here we are speaking about uh, hot cracking, the steps of the methodology are, are pretty similar. So. Uh, we will start reviewing uh, the problem itself, what is the origin of, of, of this development, uh, the problem that certain alloys present during the processing by, via a powder bed fusion laser beam melting technologies. Then uh, a first uh, processed and material analysis was required. So uh, from a theoretical point and a practical point of view, uh, these alloys uh, tackled in custodian were, were carefully studied and uh, to better understand the, the problematic, further tests were, were conducted so, so that we can assess uh, which conditions uh, should be given if we want to fix this uh, cracking issue that uh, I was mentioning. Uh, in a second step, uh, we will speak about the, about the simulation. So, uh, as you can see in this scheme, uh, the PBF LBM process was, was simulated, trying to replicate the process by adjusting the simulation model. So uh, this was done based on the feedback and, and on the information that uh, we gathered from the powder bed fusion process. And simulations uh, had the aim of investigating and finding uh, what are the idyllic shapes uh, where these optimal uh, thermal cycles that I mentioned before uh, are carried out. So once we get these, uh, these shapes, uh, our colleagues from Kai Labs, uh, as uh, Gwen was speaking before, uh, made them real by designing and manufacturing uh, this multiplane uh, light conversion system, or MPLC, as, as we said, uh, where a simple standard uh, Gaussian beam, uh, beam shape, as a conventional uh, PBF shape, was transformed into the shapes uh, proposed by the simulation. Uh, and last, uh, we will speak about uh, the integration and testing, but uh, in parallel, uh, Meanwhile, the, these, uh, these laser uh, beams were, were being uh, simulated and, and designed. An inline process control system was, was also uh, uh, developed because uh, our approach in custodian is not only to, to fix this cracking issue, but to uh, improve the process itself uh, by uh, 
make sure that by making sure that uh, every layer is, is produced in, in um, very similar conditions. Uh, and as I was saying last time, we will review the integration and testing. So, uh, uh, as I said, we can start now reviewing uh, what is what is this uh, this issue about? Uh, what is the problem of, of the hot cracking? As you uh, probably know, uh, when you buy a certain technology, we have a, a specific materials that can proceed. So, in in the case of the powder bath fusion, we can produce uh, aluminum parts, margin steels, stainless steels, uh, cobalt chromium. Uh, we can produce tit titanium between others. But uh, when uh, uh, certain applications has a uh, very specific requirements, as is the case of the aerospace. So maybe uh, Francesco, I can uh, give you. You can. You, you, the floor is yours. So you, if you can comment uh, something about this problematic, uh, about these alloys. Yes, uh, as you Mario mentioned, uh, uh, in energy and, and aerospace sector, we have to produce subcomponents made by special nickel-based superalloys, as the the mentioned that Ancona 713 low carbon and CM 247 low carbon. These kind of alloys uh, are, um, promote uh, the old cracking and they are uh, used to be, um, to be, uh, they, they, are, they have a low weldability. And, and so for this, for, for this reason, the processing of these alloys is very poor. Uh, even if we uh, if we made some components with traditional uh, technologies like uh, uh, castings and so on, uh, some of the components that we are developing uh, are very complex, and uh, the the cost of dyes is very high. For this reason, in some cases, we have to need to produce them by additive manufacturing, and so the laser power bed fusion is one of the te technique that we want to use for produce that components. But at the moment, the alloys uh, that uh, we have mentioned are not processable by LPBF. And for this reason, the custodian and the use case that we have presented aim to overcome the, the, the drawbacks related to these alloys and to the metallurgy of these alloys in order to promote enabling the production of complex components by the laser power bed fusion. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, as you were saying, we nowadays can find the technologies, uh, PBF technologies that can preheat up to 400, 500 degrees C, but this is not, not this is not enough for 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 these uh, very uh, tricky alloys. So, uh, as we have now introduced the, the problematic, we will move uh, uh, we will move towards the how we analyzed and how we analyze the material and the process itself to find out uh, which. Uh, uh, thermal conditions sh should be given. So, as you can see in the graph on on, on the on the right side of of the table, uh, dilute nickel based alloys, as for instance the Inconel seven, uh, sorry, Inconel six hundred and twenty five, are uh, readily weldable uh, due to their chemical composition. Uh, these these materials can be uh, processed by a conventional powder bed fusion technology. Uh, However, uh, when we speak about precipitation strength and alloys, as the Inconel uh, uh, 718 or the alloys that are uh, tackled in custodian, the Inconel 713 or the CM247, uh, these alloys cannot be produced because, uh, because of their uh, very complex microstructure. Uh, they are prone to defect formation. So uh, we can find plenty of information and weldability guides uh, to make a first a first evaluation of the susceptibility of uh, process failure. So, as you can see here on the graph, we are on an area of non-weldable alloys, right? So, in a first step, uh, we carried out many tests with the standard setup to better understand the origin of this problem. Here you can see uh, some micrographs where you can see the cracks uh, growing between, uh, between uh, the grain boundaries and uh, reproducing uh, in several layers. Uh, so, um, Based on these experiments, on these uh, sorry. Based on these experiments, uh, we can conclude that uh, the main solidification defects of, of these alloys uh, processed by, by powder bath fusion technologies are classified in, in these two main groups. So, on the one hand, we have the solidification cracking, which is formed when the semi-solid region experiences its linkage stresses, and so the small amount of liquid and grain boundaries easy, easily develop uh, these uh, 
cracks that we can see. On the other hand, uh, uh, cracks originated uh, by grain boundary liquidation, uh, and this is caused uh, as a result of a local dissolution of uh, low melting point phases. Uh, as, as I was saying before, the way the melt pool is, is solidified in this uh, in these alloys plays a special role in <coughs> uh, in in in, uh, in the cracking uh, phenomenon, and especially in the final stages stages of the solidification. So we can say that uh, there are two main routes uh, to sort this cracking uh, this cracking problem out. So uh, one one uh, route to to solve this problem will will be to modify the chemistry and and develop new materials, but uh, this is uh, scientifically challenging, uh, this is time consuming, and uh, this sector is very strict in, in the materials that they use, so this is a, a very a tricky uh, uh, way to, 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 to fix this issue. Uh, or we can change, uh, or we can adjust the process so that uh, these thermal cycles um, accommodate better to, to these alloys that we process. Uh, and so this is the, the, the project that we have followed within, within custodian program, right? So uh, to better understand this cracking mechanism, uh, we planned and, and conducted several tests on, on the standard machine, trying to replicate different cooling rates just to see uh, at which point we can manage to reduce or to eliminate uh, these cracks. So uh, our approach was, as you can see in this scheme on the right, on the top uh, side of the presentation, was to heat up uh, some uh, super super uh, nickel based alloys up to a certain temperature so these blocks of, of nickel alloys uh, and when they uh, reach this these target temperatures by means of uh, induction heating uh, so when the sample is at a certain temperature we stop the heating source and we carry out a single track to uh, analyze if crack appears under certain uh, 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 thermal cycles. So as you can see uh, on the left, uh, in the case of the Incorel, and on the right, in the case of the CM247, when we preheat the samples at uh, 900 degrees C, uh, we can find uh, cracks. Uh, it, they are less evident in the case of the Incorel, but in both cases we can see cracks uh, on the cross section of the, of the, of the track. Uh, however, if we uh, increase this preheating temperature up to 1330 degrees C, uh, which is a value very pretty similar than the, the theoretical values that we saw, we can see that uh, no cracks appear uh, in the in the track in the cross section of the track. So uh, with these evidences and, and the information about the timer cycles, uh, we can now move. Uh, sorry. We can now move to the uh, laser process simulation. Uh, so here, basically. Uh, uh, our colleagues from the Technical University of Vienna made a huge effort to adjust uh, the process. Uh, and pr prior to the to the to the study of of the of the definition uh, of the shapes, uh, the simulation model was uh, validated against the experiment. So here you can see some of the uh, tests that we did uh, that we conducted to adjust the simulation uh, to the reality. So in this case, it's an Inconel seven thirteen sample that was uh, built layer by layer, but uh, in the last uh, layer, uh, we just, uh, we delivered the powder as, as normal, but we just uh, melted a single track and that was done to measure and to uh, characterize the dimensions of this, uh, of this uh, track, of this added material in just a single layer. So uh, as you can see in the images, we are able to obtain very similar dimensions uh, in the cross-section simulation. Uh, so uh, there was a, a lot of effort put here uh, to calculate and to simulate uh, uh, and to replicate the powder conductivity to obtain a very similar uh, results than, than in the reality. Okay. And here, wait, here we can see uh, some of the uh, um, simulations that uh, the Technical University of Vienna uh, conducted. So uh, on the top, you can see a lack of fusion test that uh, was carried out on Inconel 713 low carbon. On the, on the left, you can see uh, the real test where we can see that uh, due to this uh, low energy, there was a low, uh, there was low wettability and we got these this small balls. And so the same happened uh, in the simulation, as you can see. So it, it seems that the simulation is representing uh, 
pretty nice what is happening in, in, in the in the powder bath. Okay. Okay, and on the bottom, uh, not a single track, but an entire layer was uh, replicated under certain parameters. So uh, on the right, you can see uh, a real image of uh, what was uh, carried out here at IDME in the PBF machine. And on the left, you can see that the simulation uh, of these uh, consecutive uh, laser tracks, one after the other, uh, but not, not only a single layer was, was simulated, but also uh, layers, uh, consecutive layers as, as the process, uh, as, the, as the real process, right? So, uh, before defining the shapes, uh, a list of the requirements was uh, proposed. We were discussing about uh, which kind of, of shape will be better for, for, the, for the project. Uh, and uh, as you may know, uh, um, PBF process uh, works uh, producing tracks in multiple directions, moving back and forth continuously. So, we cannot predict what is the direction that the, that the beam will follow uh, because uh, Normally, between layers, we have some rotations. So as we we cannot uh, uh, rotate the shapes in the beam shaper, we have uh, we have to go for for a, a round symmetrical shape as the one you, you see here, uh, where we have two uh, two main beams: uh, the the one the primary beam, which is uh, aimed to melt the powder, and the secondary beam, uh, which is aimed to uh, pre-post heat the the area that is being melted. So regarding the primary beam, this is we maintain the a Gaussian beam distribution. Meanwhile, for the secondary beam, uh, we decided to go on with a top hat distribution. Uh, and this was decided because, as you can see on the on the right, if we follow an unidirectional uh, approach, a scanning approach with no rotation, uh, with no uh, meandering, and so on, we got these uh, swelling issues, this, this uh, top surface which is distorted, and even the cracks are. Uh, um, we can find more cracks in. So uh, the optimization criteria was basically to test different shapes, modifying the diameter of the uh, and the intensity of, of uh, the primary and the secondary beams. So as, as shown on the left, uh, the primary beam was always considered in the Gaussian, as I said. Uh, we, meanwhile, the secondary was a uh, top hat, and the approach here was to replicate the cooling rates oriented uh, obtained uh, uh, that I was speaking before about the preheating tests. So you can he you can see here some of the tests carried out by the Technical University of Vienna, where different cooling rates were carried out by means of different uh, shapes and different power distributions. Uh, this was initially done for for the uh, for the uh, multi-static MPLC. So we got up to six optics, six configurations, where uh, as you can see here. Uh, these optics combine uh, two primary beams of uh, 176 and 528 microns with uh, three secondary beams uh, from, from three up to six millimeters. Uh, however, we found some, some issues while testing this. So for this reason, uh, we decided to move on uh, to the dynamic MPC. Uh, I will focus indeed my presentation on, on this, uh, on this uh, multi-static, so, sorry, this dynamic mid shaper. Uh, and this was uh, based on one of the optics, in this case, the second optic, and you can see here, of the multi-static beam shaper. So in this case, uh, we have uh, a, a range of, of, uh, of uh, power ratios that we can adjust by modifying the voltage of uh, one of the galvos of the dynamic shaper. So uh, the diameter is always the same, 175 and 4, mic and, uh, four uh, millimeters, but as you can see here, we can set different power ratios between the, between the secondary and the primary beam. Uh, moving to the beam shaping, uh, this is the step uh, where, where things, uh, where the beam shapes that uh, I was commenting uh, are made uh, real. Uh, again, I will not spend more time on this. These are the target shapes that were proposed and they already showed in the simulation slide. Uh, so uh, here on the left, you can see the outcome of the development in the case of the uh, multi-static beam shaper. These are some uh, some drawings before the installation. So basically, the, the multi-static beam shaper was divided into two modules. The one uh, uh, placed outside where the beam is modified, you can see here, 
And uh, where we can change these uh, optics manually, we can modify from uh, these, these uh, six optics that I, I show you. And one placed inside uh, by the scanning head, which is aimed to, uh, to perform the beam alignment uh, before the, the, the beam uh, enters into the scanning head. So uh, here you can see some uh, primes characterizations uh, carried out on, on one of the six shapes that uh, were defined previously. Uh, and regarding the dynamic beam shaper, uh, on the right you can see some images. In this case, we can uh, modify the power ratio uh, between the primary and the secondary beam, as I said. Uh, and it, it is made up of uh, two modules uh, as well. Uh, the internal module is the alignment module and is almost the same than for the uh, multi-static. But uh, the second, the, 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 the shaping module, which is outside of the machine, is completely new. Here you can see some uh, images and some preliminary results that we got uh, uh, in the measurements of the of the different uh, configuration of the, of the dynamic shaper. So uh, again, the beam was characterized once uh, once the dynamic shaper uh, was installed into the PBF model uh, into the PBF uh, uh, machine. So and even though uh, we observed slight deviations uh, in comparison to the theoretical values that uh, uh, that were proposed, uh, we can see that we can adjust the power ratio as, as you can see from a um, from a 50-50, so 50% of the power to the primary and 50 to the secondary, up to 23-77%, uh, which allows us to, to play with different uh, uh, with different uh, parameters, right? So in parallel to all these developments that uh, I've been explaining, the inline, uh, cross, uh, the inline uh, process control system was developed. Since the idea of, of custodian, as he was saying, is not only to modify the, the way the energy is delivered, but also to uh, control and to manage that uh, the layers are processed uh, in a repetitive manner, avoiding uh, over or underheating uh, during the process. So uh, here um, in this slide, you can see a very brief scheme of the overall solution for, for monitoring and, and control. So uh, the embedded system uh, was integrated in the in the controller, uh, the, FP, the FPGA architecture, which controls the features and the medium wave infrared sensor. So uh, this device uh, is able to feed back the process. Uh, so in our case, in the case of the powder bed fusion, uh, it was directly directly connected to the analog input of the laser, so that uh, it can it can control the, the laser scaling level depending on, on what is being measured uh, in the powder bed. Uh, here are some pictures of the, of the final system already assembled and before installing it into the PBF system. And so, uh, as the plan was to measure what, and, the, and assess what, what is happening in the melt pool in real time, the camera was installed in, in an on-axis position, as you can see in the, in the images. So before the installation of the scanning head, uh, the beam bender, which is one of the mirrors that reflect the light uh, inside of the of the of this scanning head that you can see here, was specific, specifically coated uh, to reflect the light in the infrared uh, wavelength. So uh, because we just wanted to make sure that uh, there is enough signal that uh, achieves the, the the camera or the, the infrared sensor. So thanks to this. When the laser uh, is melting, this back reflection is driven from the powder bed through the f theta lens, the Galvo mirrors of the uh, scanning head, and the beam bender. Uh, so uh, this signal, this uh, back reflection, <coughs> is captured and analyzed by the uh, by the uh, process control system. And here you can see uh, some images that that we got uh, from uh, consecutive layers, and something that we realize is that. Uh, the, the temperature, the process temperature, uh, increases uh, significantly from one layer to the other. So, uh, as a, as the powder bed fusion process is quite fast and move, uh, moves randomly, uh, we cannot uh, modify uh, the laser power while the laser is melting. But as an alternative, uh, it was proposed to perform the closed control loop after each layer. So, based on the information that was captured in the in the layer before. Uh, so, as you can see on the bottom left, the data is processed uh, and no matter how many parts are, uh, are being produced, no, no, no matter how short, how large is the layer, uh, the system is able to identify, is capable to, to identify when the layer starts and when the layer finished. And so, 
after this, after each layer, uh, the power is, is adjusted. So in this sense, uh, the, the, the point here is that the PVF process, especially in the first, uh, in the first, uh, very first layers, is very unstable because uh, we don't have uh, enough powder. So uh, we decided that uh, the process control system will be switched off for the first eight layers. But uh, so in, in this case, the power uh, is not being affected by the by the control loop. But after these uh, eight layers, uh, uh, the laser power is monitored as, and it's modified uh, consecutively after each layer. So for instance, layer nine is processed and monitored and powder is uh, adjusted after that. So that layer number 10 is produced with the, with the power uh, adjusted, depending on what is happening in the, in the layer, right? Uh, so now it's time to speak about uh, the integration and testing of, of all these uh, systems that I uh, mentioned. Uh, I will briefly explain uh, some, some, uh, some part of the integ integration. So um, as you can imagine, since we are now, uh, now with this approach, we are not only melting the powder, but we are heating, the, heating it. Uh, we have to integrate a, a high power laser because now we need more power, right? So on the left, you can see the former scanning head that was substituted by a high power uh, scanning head. Uh, on the bottom, you can see the concept laser and three machine where all this development was carried out with a high power laser. And on the right, on top, you can see the scanning head attached to the uh, beam alignment module, which is uh, I'm to, uh, yes, to find, adjust or find, uh, align the beam before it enters into the scanning head. On the bottom, you can see on the left, the multi-static beam shaper and the dynamic beam shaper. So I will focus the, the speech on the dynamic MPLC because the, the end results were achieved with this configuration. Uh, as I said, as I was saying, this is the alignment module. This is the shaping module. When we can find uh, an straight line interface and a straight line sensor, uh, this is a security measurement introduced by Kylabs that uh, triggers the laser in case of uh, a sudden change in the light inside of the beam shaper occurs. And we have to integrate some uh, uh, specific water cooling uh, capacities and an air overpressure to make sure that uh, dust or contamination is not uh, coming into the laser pad. So uh, um, I will now focus on the, on the test that we did uh, with the dynamic beam shaper. Uh, so in general terms, uh, for each design of experiments for each uh, nine coupons that, that you will see here on the right. Uh, we set two parameters that are modified, in this case, the scanning speed and the line offset. Meanwhile, the rest of the parameters as the laser power, the layer thickness, the scanning strategy, uh, and some other parameters that can affect the process will remain fixed so that we can uh, assess uh, what is the effect uh, uh, or what is the behavior of, of, of the material under these two, these two uh, parameters, the scanning speed and the line offset. Uh, and uh, a summary, uh, all, the, all the experiments were carried out using uh, uh, 67 degrees of rotation between layers. So as you can see here, this, this is the mapping that we did for the Incolin 713 on top and for the CM247 on, on the bottom. We have tested the whole range of, of, uh, of power ratios from 1.7 volts, which is 50-50 for the primary and secondary, up to 2.7 volt, which is 23-77%. Uh, so uh, the same for the for the CM247. We have followed different approaches because what we want to, to check what is happening uh, under different conditions. So in the in the case of the Incolent 713, we have focused the, the experiments on low power and uh, low scanning speed. Uh, and we got uh, some samples. Uh, meanwhile, for the CM247, as you can see here, we increased the power up to uh, maximum power for, for this optics, which is about uh, two kilowatts, so that uh, we can map what is happening uh, in different uh, in different range of, of, of laser power. So in green here, you can see uh, the samples that were uh, successfully built. Meanwhile, uh, in orange and in red, you can see the ones that uh, were stopped during the process because of uh, powder delivery issues, because of the swelling on the surface, bowling on uh, or other uh, uh, defects that, that can occur in the PBF process. Mario, it's the last two minutes. Okay. Uh, we can clearly see a, a huge difference when, when increasing the laser power in the secondary beam. As you can see here, uh, 
uh, huge balls are attached to the contour of the part, uh, and that's because uh, this secondary beam is partially melting the powder because the powder is not conducting itself. So uh, all the energy is absorbed by the particles, and then uh, this powder is, is getting melted, right? So uh, this is uh, this is problematic as you can see here because uh, when we are delivering powder, these uh, these uh, balls affect uh, into the swiper into the raking system, and so it's damaged, and the powder cannot be um, delivered in a uh, in a correct manner, let's say. So. Uh, for now, we have focused on our, our, our characterization on the Incolon 713. We have selected the most promising samples, as you can see here. And I will just skip to the next slides because uh, here uh, we can clearly see the, the, the results. So sample uh, 3 slash 3 from experimental 3 uh, presents uh, evident cracks, especially on the bottom and on the top. But uh, if we focus on the mid thickness, uh, we can see a very clear uh, microstructure. Cracks uh, shown uh, features of uh, inter intergranular hot tears, which are uh, already observed in the powder bed fusion uh, uh, with the standard powder bed fusion technology. Uh, so, if we look at the samples of experimental four, which have a slight increase of the energy density, if I remember well, uh, the laser power was was increased. Um, cracks at mid thickness are significantly smaller, and uh, large cracks with open uh, faces are. Um, are less frequent. So these results are pretty similar uh, to those of liquidation cracking, where small a volume of low melting phases segregated at boundaries shift to, shift, shift to liquid during the process and reduce a uh, cohesion between uh, uh, cohesion of the solid uh, volume. So what we can conclude from this first assessment of the process is that uh, beam shaping is, uh, induces a, a clear change in, in the solidification conditions leading to a remarkable improvement in the sample uh, quality, especially uh, focusing on the mid part, on the mid area of, of, of the samples, where we observe uh, that uh, there are processing conditions that uh, where hot cracking is uh, dramatically reduced. So there is evidence for some conditions uh, that large uh, hot tears uh, can be almost fully eliminated. So in some cases, these, car these cracks are replaced by smaller liquidation cracks, which are related uh, to the melting uh, of constituent segregated and, and grain boundaries in the solid material layers immediately beneath the laser tracks uh, being deposited. Uh, in addition to, to the samples manufactured in the, in the mapping, we have, uh, we have created, we have manufactured uh, some uh, demo parts that represent or pretend to represent real parts that uh, were suggested by by the end user by by uh, GFM. So uh, these parts are, are being assessed, but uh, we have some preliminary results that uh, Francesco sent me some uh, hours ago about uh, the density of these parts, and uh, they look pretty nice. You can see here that they are close to uh, 89, 88 percent, which is very promising. Uh, as a summary, um, this new methodology of sorry. This new methodology of application uh, driven uh, laser beam tailoring of ma uh, material microstructure, we have generated uh, a new a new methodology for for creating new new uh, beam shapes uh, that uh, helps us to to tackle different uh, different uh, issues while processing in PBF system, and uh, a controlling line system that uh, was uh, based on an uncooled uh, uh, medium wave infrared sensor an NFPA architecture. Uh, to ensure uh, repetitivity in a layer by layer way. So, um, regarding the, the impact of, of the project, uh, maybe Francesco, you want to add something here at this point. Uh, uh, but from my side, uh, I can say that uh, although we have uh, still some, uh, some uh, development that to do to, to get rid of, of cracks, uh, if we achieve the custodian main objectives, uh, we will be able to build parts in a layer by layer manner, which is actually not possible. And uh, it gives uh, uh, a change in 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 sense of the of the production time and and, and, and the part uh, costs. And what is more important is that uh, here we have uh, more freedom, uh, design freedom that uh, brings this additive technology, so we can produce more complex parts. Uh, don't know, uh, Francesco, if you want to add something. These are some of the parts that uh, are being produced by by uh, GFM. 
Yes, Maria, thank you. As you can see on the screen, there are a lot of, 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 uh, of parts that we are able to produce, and there are a lot of parts that made of uh, in, that um, are in, inside of the turbines and and so on. And GFM uh, aims to produce complex part by power bed fusion, but in some cases, these parts and complex uh, uh, components are made by special alloys. So the aim was to enable the GFM or uh, the manufacturer of the OPS gas turbine to produce more complex part with more complex uh, alloys as the alloys that we have studied and, present and uh, propose in uh, in uh, crystal approach. The results that we, we have obtained are very promising because as Mario told us, uh, we reduce the, the formation of cracks and we hope to increase the, of the, the sorry the, the process parameters in order to produce real part with um, with uh, uh, an high building rate uh, to reduce also uh, the cost and uh, to make the affordable uh, part for the for the aerospace and energy sectors. Thank you, Francesco. You're welcome. Uh, that's all from from our side. If you have any question, uh, you can drop it in the chat box, so uh, we will try to to answer you to help you. Uh, thank you for for attending the meeting and for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, <coughs> Mario and Francesco, thank you for your presentation. And let's go now uh, with the presentation of Marcus Kogel from Presitec. Uh, about the laser cutting use case. Marcus? Yes, here I am. Okay, I hope perfect. you uh, you understand me and you see yeah. me all also. So uh, I will now bring my slides to the screen. Okay. Second. This is my presentation. You have to. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, let's see if it charges. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So that's it. So, okay, so the final presentation uh, for today in the Castorian project, uh, as it was already mentioned, we have used the uh, MPLC device from Calebs to find new improvements in uh, laser cutting. And I uh, think uh, all, all of those who listen may have an idea of uh, laser cutting. You see here a video. I hope you see the video moving. Um, yes. This is, this is uh, standard laser cutting these days. So we have, uh, we have a nozzle uh, which is more or less um, uh, one millimeter uh, distance to the surface. We have some uh, processing uh, gas, nitrogen or oxygen, depends on the cutting process. And this is blown through the cutting curve and it's blowing away all the material which is melted. And in the end, we have a hopefully very nice cutting curve on the right and on the left of the uh, uh, parts. And yes, even though um, to understand the cutting process and to see what really happens in the process, um, uh, we have we have started to do some influencing on the beam shaping, and definitely we did some uh, sensor stuff to really see inside the material during the cutting process and to really see the cutting front, the melt flow of the material, and some more information and this we did to just to find out if there is a possibility to improve the cutting process by changing the uh, uh, um, the the the, the uh, um, intensity distribution on the top of the cutting curve and in the cutting curve as well you see here um, a material of uh, about 20 millimeter thickness. So this is what we addressed in Custodian, thick sheet uh, cutting. So uh, as I said, the selection of the first shape. So 
what was our approach? As I already said, we have used the uh, um, X-ray device at the Stuttgart University as the, at the IFSW, um, which consists of an X-ray tube, of a scintillator, and of a camera. Um, and you can use uh, this device to look through the material during the process. So this is what we could see. So we could really see the dimensions of the cutting curve um, uh, during, during the cutting uh, process. And we could easily measure the steepness of the cutting point. And for sure, we could also, um, as you see here, uh, we could uh, uh, um, see different brightnesses during the process. So you see here, this is the cutting front, easily to see this. You can distinguish solid from, from liquid and you can uh, uh, easily uh, uh, re um, calculate or rebuild the cutting front, but you can also see uh, brighter and less bright areas. And this color, the grayscale of that um, areas directly correspond to the geometry inside, so the, to the thickness of the material. And by using that information, we can rebuild the cutting front and the, the, the cutting curve inside the material. So this is just a reconstruction, 3D reconstruction of the cutting curve based on the gray values, which we detect during um, the um, uh, X-ray um, detection. And this 3D reconstruction of the cutting curve we can use to uh, uh, um, investigate absorption. So again, you see here we have started with a, some, some decades ago, I must, I must uh, admit, with a ring shape, which we call uh, uh, a Prisitec uh, um, a bright uh, um, no, it was on bright line, uh, no matter. So that was just a ring shape. And we thought just by providing a ring shape instead of a, a standard spot, we can improve the cutting quality. That was not the case. So, but nevertheless, we applied the ring shape. We did the same. So we did reconstruct the cutting front and we did reconstruct the cutting curve. And we could do, after that, we could do some standard ray tracing. And if you do the ray tracing, you can directly see where you have hotspots. So where is a lot of intensity absorbed on the cutting front and where it is not. And this is now a, a image, so a, a, a colored image, which is just showing you the areas of high absorption and the areas of low absorption. So it's the absorbed irradiance. Uh, just uh, in, in the in the color uh, table, uh, which is more or less equal to the power, and for sure we can also calculate the losses by doing that. So this is based on the standard ring mode, but we see that we have po possibilities to improve that absorption, and with, if we can approve, improve the absorption on the full, uh, cutting front we can also improve the cutting curve and the uh, uh, um, ZR value, which is the uh, um, uh, uh, topography of the cutting curve. So the first approach was to increase the absorption of the lower point. And this was, um, the idea was then to change from a ring intensity to a horseshoe-like intensity distribution with a spot in the middle. And that was the idea to uh, when when we uh, when we joined Custodian to use the MPLC device from K Labs because from our knowledge at that point that is and still today it's the only device which can easily generate by this multiplying lane converter uh, different shapes. There are static shapes, but you can uh, easily generate that intensity distribution. And this was the one which we um, uh, went to to uh, um, to, to uh, uh, K Labs, 
and we told them, okay, this is the geometry we need. So that we have the dimensions of the horseshoe, uh, inner and outer diameter. We said which uh, um, uh, ratio of uh, laser power we wanted to have. Um, so a Gaussian dot uh, in the, just behind the horseshoe uh, with the less power. And all that was based on the simulations we did uh, um, based on the absorption and based on the 3D reconstruction of the cut. So that was the simulation done by um, by by Kylabs, uh, by Mathieu and and Gwen. And uh, you see the, the 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 main advantage we see in the Kylab solution is that in uh, a high uh, um, uh, Z range, so from minus four to plus four, we more or less have the same geometry, the same intensity distribution. So for, for sure you can you can build some kind of diffractive optical elements to maybe have the same shape, but you will never get uh, a Z range uh, of a size like that. And this is important for thick sheet cutting that if you change the intensity distribution, it must contain over a long range. So this is what we did. Um, we had get to version one from K-Labs. Uh, that was the previous measurement, um, but we also have seen that the beam was not coaxial to the nozzle axis. And you see, we did some measurements. We get the maximum power loss of 14%. Um, uh, and that was clear that there was a clipping of the of the beam. We have directly seen that the clipping of the beam was at the nozzle. So we had to go with the version two. This is the version two, the MPLC, and you see the long Z range with more or less contained uh, um, intensity distribution. So the depth of field was plus minus two millimeter. We did not see any power loss. Uh, we worked with a nozzle diameter smaller than three millimeters. So this is a typical nozzle we use with that thick sheet cutting. So then we could start to do the cutting trials. And you see uh, we, our process parameters. So as it was already mentioned, we use the 14301 material. So the uh, uh, um, uh, stainless steel and we did investigate cutting it from five millimeter to 30 millimeter sheet thicknesses. We vary the focus position. Um, at that point, we used a bigger nozzle diameter. So um, just to not to change the process parameters or the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, device parameters when we change the uh, cutting um, material thickness. And we also did some variations in pressure of the uh, nitrogen and of the um, distance of the nozzle to the workpiece. So you see, we did a lot of lot of experiments. Um, and this is how it looked like when uh, we, we did the trials. Just, it is, again, still a standard cutting process. But the desire was um, not to, to completely change cutting world. The desire was to be faster and to get a better um, a cutting curve. Uh, reference. Okay, that was the cutting process, and for sure we did some measurements of the results. So you see the different uh, sheet thicknesses, and the really impressive uh, 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 roughnesses. So uh, nowadays we use OCT uh, devices uh, also for the measurement of the surface topography. So there is a device which. Uh, comes from Presitec Optronic, which is flying spot scanner, where you can easily in a fraction of a minute measure the topography of the uh, of the cutting curve. And by um, using standard uh, programs, you can easily measure the, uh, the roughness of the um, of the uh, 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 cutting results. So still with the MPLC, our cutting thickness was uh, uh, 30 millimeters. Uh, you see here also the mean RZ values uh, of the right and left edges uh, in different uh, focus positions. So we 
for those who are familiar with roughness values, these are very good roughness values for sheet thicknesses um, of 10 millimeters. So uh, for sure, we uh, we reached, uh, reached one uh, result with the uh, MPLC device. Uh, we get a very, very smooth cutting curve. And again, this is uh, shown here. So uh, uh, in slow feed rates, we even get better uh, RZ values than with uh, standard cutting uh, um, uh, devices without beam shaping. So the conclusion we can drive from uh, the custodian project. Uh, so uh, with the uh, um, X-ray device and with the possibility to uh, simulate the absorption on the cutting front uh, by a 3D reconstruction of the uh, uh, cutting curve, we are now able to um, design the best intensity distribution. So the horseshoe and dot intensity distribution was just a, a start which we used. For sure, um, this is not a symmetric intensity distribution. So in the end, um, for a uh, industrial solution, the MPLC has to be smaller and lighter and um, the, the, the uh, intensity distribution has to be uh, 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 symmetric because we will not be able to turn around the cutting net during the process. But this is, as I said, just the start. So the methodology uh, is working and uh, we will uh, continue our work with Kylabs uh, also after uh, Custodian and um, do some improvements uh, of the of the device and um, as we have seen we have to be more flexible uh, because different sheet thicknesses and materials require different dimensions so typically uh, a pressure tech cutting net is not built for just one sheet thickness we typically provide possibilities to move the uh, the set uh, um, uh, um, focus point to be able to work on different sheet thicknesses. But this is the next step. The first step, and uh, we are now, I would say, at a technologically readiness level of between six and seven. And uh, after the project, we will definitely continue that. And we, you will see some of pressure cutting nets in the future with uh, dedicated uh, intensity distributions for dedicated materials, I would say. Let's keep it that uh, um, uh, vague so we cannot say more, but uh, you will definitely see uh, um, an improvement of what we have uh, gained in custodian. And uh, at that point, uh, we definitely also uh, thank all the partners, also thank uh, uh, the people at, uh, at IMAN for the uh, um, great project um, uh, uh, um, coordination. And yes, that was uh, Press Tech part in Custodian. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, you know my my uh, email address, it's quite easy to find that on the web and uh, you can also approach me anytime. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Thank you for your presentation, uh, how this laser, laser cutting use case. And let's go uh, now to, to the Q&A. Um, let me see, okay. Um, the Q and A session. I could see in the uh, chat that we had one question from Iñaki Diaz. Uh, I don't know, Iñaki, if you prefer to to open your micro and and make the question directly in order to uh, well. Yes, if you want, I can I can do it. Well, what I can, but I think it was it was already solved in the last. In the last cutting session, I was asking if we can, you, if with this, that system, you can change dynamically 
the power ratio. Okay. I understand, James, but I don't know. You can do it. And also, that, that, that is clear that you cannot change the, the beam shape dynamically, no? because it has to be tailored by application. That is what I understand. No? Yeah. Uh, could no. any expert uh, yes. respond to Iñaki? Jorge? Yes, Jorge, Jorge Arias. Hello, Iñaki. Um, it was different in depending on the use case. For example, in PV, in PBF, mm -hmm. the the, um, the dynamic change is on the power ratio between the two okay. the two beams. But in laser beam welding, what is the dynamically changed with the control system is the is the width of the rectangular shape of the, okay. of the secondary beam. But we are able to adjust the power ratio before process, so we can we we are able to <coughs> modify the power ratio and then during process change or, or adjust with the control system the 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 being the secondary being with. So we we can play with with both parameters, but mm -hmm. well in the, in in in, in laser beam welding. We based our results in, on the simulation, so we got the the beam width and the power ratio from the simulation, and we use those values in, with our PLC to see how it works. And we and we well, we, also, well, we have the demonstrate that these values were were valid or. Mm -hmm. Very valid to, to to improve the quality of, of being welding for this particular application. Okay, understood, Jorge. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Iñaki, for for your question, and thank you, Jorge, for for clarifying uh, it to to Iñaki. Um, I don't know if there is uh, any other question. I couldn't see another one in 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 the chat. You can open your micro in case you have any question to the speakers. If not, well, let's let's finish. It's one minute to to five. Let's finish this this workshop. Thank you very much for those who who could attend. Uh, it has been uh, it's been recorded, uh, and we will uh, use it. We can uh, share it uh, for your use in in the next days. Thank you all the speakers for your presentation and uh, the good results uh, got in, in these use cases. And that's it on my on my side. Just one question, Sergio. Yes. Yeah. Where, where are you sharing the, the workshop? Okay, the the three the two webinars that we had uh, yesterday and the workshop have been recorded. Then we will uh, decide uh, where to publish them. If, for example, in the YouTube channel could be one place, but uh, first of all we have 